A very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the basic principles of oxygen therapy in COVID-19. So in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'll be talking about the mechanism of hypoxia in COVID-19, the goals of oxygen therapy, the various oxygen delivery systems that are available, such as the conventional oxygen therapy, high flow nasal oxygenation, the non-invasive ventilation, and end it with a brief algorithm of how to institute oxygen therapy in these patients. So we all know that oxygen is essential <clears throat> for all metabolic processes and lack of oxygen affects all organ function. And if left untreated, it can cause irreversible damage over time. Hypoxemia is the most common manifestation of COVID-19 disease. And in fact, 14% of all patients will present with severe respiratory disease with type one respiratory failure. Out of these 14%, almost 5% will be critically ill and require ICU admission. Severe hypoxemia will require non-invasive respiratory support or oxygen therapy in some. These patients often do not have a um, problem in uh, breathing and there is no hypercapnia. And sometimes a subset of this, these patients will not present with dyspnea even though they have low saturation. So this, uh, therefore, the coining of the term happy hypoxemia, wherein the patient has a low oxygen saturation, but does not feel dyspnea. So hypoxia in COVID-19 patients in the early phase is caused by the damage or dysregulation of pulmonary blood vessels, which leads to impaired transfer of oxygen. And this is often resolved by instituting non-invasive oxygen therapy. However, if the patient deteriorates or there is uh, no institution of treatment, the patient can worsen and progress on to acute respiratory distress syndrome, wherein the patient will require tracheal intubation and institution of mechanical ventilation. These patients uh, will present with symptoms of dyspnea, tachypnea, feeling of tightness in the chest. And this can be, the hypoxia can be uh, actually um, diagnosed by applying a peripheral oxygen saturation monitor, which is readily available, is not very expensive. It is easy to use and quick to monitor. In addition, an arterial blood gas is the gold standard if it is available to look at the PF ratios, which can help you categorize the severity of ARDS. If you don't have an arterial blood gas anal analyzer, then another ratio which can be used instead of um, PF ratio is the saturation by FiO2 ratio, which is a very useful and non-invasive marker and has found to correlate very well with the PF ratios. In addition, one should also look for signs of increased work of breathing, such as flaring of the nasal ali nasi and uh, use of sternocleidomastoid or retraction of the intercostal muscles. So the goal of oxygen therapy is to maintain adequate tissue oxygenation. And by Giving oxygen, one increases the alveolar and blood levels of oxygen to correct the acute hypoxia. In addition, it decreases the symptoms which are associated with hypoxia, such as dyspnea and derangement of mental function. In addition, it also reduces the cardiopulmonary workload and reduces the hypoxic pulmonary velo constriction. The saturation target that one should aim at is if the patient is being kept in the ward, then it should be around 92 to 94%. In increasing the limit of this saturation does not achieve much in terms of uh, advantages, but leads to increased consumption of oxygen or wastage of oxygen. If the patient is being kept in the ICU, which is a highly monitored environment, one can even aim for a lower saturation of 90 to 92%. So the uh, oxygen delivery devices, what are they? they? They are devices for delivering oxygen to conscious patients with no instrumentation to their airway and uh, can be of three types. First is the conventional oxygen therapy, which is readily available in most centers and is uh, classified into two types, low flow and high flow. And I will come to it a little later, the detail. Then the second is the high flow nasal oxygenation and non-invasive ventilation. The conventional oxygen therapy is subclassified into two types, the high flow system and the low flow system, depending on the amount of inspired gas flow that it provides. In a high flow system, uh, the, it is, the patient's inspired gas is provided by the 
delivery system and therefore the FiO2 remains stable. However, in a low flow system, the patient needs to draw the remainder of his minute volume requirement from surrounding air and therefore more the minute volume, lower the FiO2. Therefore, the FiO2 remains variable depending on the patient's own minute volume. So this is just a diagram to depict what I was telling you earlier. And the blue dotted line is the uh, flow of the device. Uh, in a low flow device, as you can see, as long as the patient's minute volume is, remains less, then the patient's, uh, the device's total gas flow, the FiO2 remains stable. However, if it increases, it no longer delivers that FiO2. On the other hand, the high flow device is already providing uh, adequate gas flow to cater for all kinds of needs. And just to emphasize what I was, uh, what I told you in the last two slides is, say a patient has a normal minute volume of five liters per minute and is receiving oxygen at two liters per minute. So two liters of 100% oxygen is diluted to three liters per minute of air drawn into the mass to compensate for that five liters per minute of uh, minute volume. And therefore the um, FiO2 comes down to 0.5. However, if the same patient develops respiratory distress and the minute volume, say for example, increases to 30 liters per minute. So the oxygen flow rate remains same, two liter per minute. Now it is diluted with 28 liters per minute of air, which is drawn into the mass. And therefore the FiO2 drops 0.26. The most commonly available and readily used is device for a low flow oxygen therapy is nasal cannula, and it is able to deliver a FiO2 of 0.24 to 0.44 uh, with a flow of up to six liters per minute. The advantages, like I said, is it's very easy to use, it is disposable, it is not very costly, it is very well tolerated by the patient, and the patient can talk, eat, and drink while the device is in place. The only disadvantage of nasal cannula is that it cannot provide a very high FiO2, and also with high flow, it causes drying and thrusting of nasal mucosa. So this table actually tells you about the various FiO2 depending on the, uh, the total flow of oxygen through the nasal cannula. And as you can see, with every one liter increase in the oxygen flow rate, the, the, saturated, the FiO2 increases by 4%. So the next uh, common device for low flow oxygen therapy is a simple face mask, also known as the Hudson mask. It is again very cheap and easily available and uh, very well tolerated by the patient. Uh, however, one should ensure that the oxygen flow is more than six liters per minute. Otherwise, there might be some rebreathing of carbon dioxide. The maximum FiO2 that is achieved is 0.6% and uh, it may be lowered in the presence of respiratory distress. The low flow device with a very capable of delivering a very high FiO2 and which is being used extensively in patients with COVID-19 is the non-rebreathing re reservoir mask. This is basically a um, um, face mask which is attached to a reservoir bag which has a capacity of one liter. And between the mask and the reservoir bag, there is a one-way bag which prevents the patient from breathing the expired air. So this can be set to deliver FiO2 between 0.8 to 0.95 with an oxygen flow of 10 and 15 liters per minute. But whenever you use this, one should ensure that the mask is properly fitting and the bag is inflated at all times. So fixed performance systems uh, are the systems where the oxygen delivery is independent of patient factors and the prototype of the system is the Venturi type mask, where the oxygen concentration delivered is determined by the Venturi principle, which is the oxygen passing through a small orifice and drains air to a predictable dilution. And this FiO2 can be adjusted by changing the Venturi valve and setting the appropriate oxygen flow rate, which is depicted by the very well by the next uh, slide, where you can see this is uh, oxygen mask. And this is the venturi device, and this is the cross section of the venturi device. As you can see, this is the orifice, and oxygen passes through this narrow orifice at a higher pressure. So there is a fall of pressure around this jet of oxygen, which leads to entrainment of air, leading to the pre uh, predictable FiO2. The larger the um, jet orifice, uh, lesser the pressure drop, less entrainment of air, and therefore a higher FiO2. So after the conventional oxygen therapy, I want to talk about the high flow nasal oxygenation system, 
which is being again used uh, widely wherever available uh, for the COVID-19 patients. And this consists of a flow oxygen flow meter, which is connected to a blender, which uh, is capable of delivering FiO2 ranging from 0.21 to 100% and generating gas flows of as high as 60 to 80 liters per minute. So the generated gas flow, according to said FiO2, is passed through a humidifier, which warms as well as humidifies the gases then transported through an inspirated tubing to a nasal interface, which consists of soft and pliable nasal cannula. So uh, you should fit the nasal prongs onto the patient's uh, face, initiate maximum flow, which is 60 liters per minute. And after initiating maximum flow, uh, the thing to do immediately is to place a surgical mask on the patient's face so that the aerosol dispersion is less. Then you start with a higher FiO2 and come down as per the oxygenation level. Similarly, for the temperature, you start with a higher temperature and you can bring down, bring it down to 34 degrees centigrade as uh, the patient's tolerance level. So besides delivering a heated humidified uh, air, which is delivered at a very high flow, capable of delivering a very high FiO2, uh, it has HFNC has a lot of additional uh, physiological benefits. It flushes the nasopharynx with oxygen, which helps in improving oxygenation and reduces the dead space both at the same time. Because of the higher flow, there is an expiratory impedance which generates an extrinsic peep of about four to six centimeters of water and lowers the respiratory rate and thereby reduces the work of breathing. Uh, heating and humidification of these gases preserves the mucosillary function and helps in clearance of the respiratory function. When the patient is, uh, is on uh, HFNC device, one should monitor the saturation, the respiratory rate, and the breathing pattern. And a very good index to predict the HFNC failure is a ROCS index, which is the SpO to FiO2 ratio divided by the respiratory, respiratory rate. And it has been shown that the ROCS index of less than 3.85 at 12 hours uh, is a very good predictor of HFNC failure. And that means that this patient should be uh, intubated and put on mechanical ventilation. The uh, main hazard of HFNC is that it requires good monitoring. And if the monitoring is not there, it can lead to delay in intubation, uh, which increases the complication, respiratory complications. So after HFNC, we come to non-invasive ventilation where positive pressure is generated in the lungs, in the airway, uh, by a device which could be a stand standalone or uh, through an ICU ventilator. And uh, this can be, uh, which is delivered through an in interface. So I will come to the interfaces a little later. And non-invasive ventilation is basically of two types, uh, CPAP, which is a continuous positive air pressure, positive pressure throughout the respiratory cycle and BiPAP, which is varying positive pressure uh, um, in both inspiration as well as expiration. Uh, EPAP is the expiratory positive airway pressure. It keeps the alveoli inflated, increases lung volume, and thereby the FRC, which helps in, in improving the alveolar gas exchange and the oxygenation. The IPAP or pressure support, also known as pressure support, supports the inspiratory effort and thereby augments tidal volume. It helps in efficient removal of carbon dioxide and therefore it is more useful in patients who have uh, associated hypercapnia or underlying COPD. It also reduces the work of breathing considerably. So the most commonly used uh, interface is the full face mask, which is otherwise good because it's associated with fewer air leaks, but it is difficult to tolerate. The main disadvantages is that it can, uh, if there is vomiting, there are chances of aspiration, patients may feel claustrophobia, and there can be some possible skin damage. In addition, speaking and coughing is difficult. Nasal mask, on the other hand, the advantage is that the patient can speak, eat, and drink can cough effectively and there is reduced danger of vomiting. However, the main disadvantage of a nasal mask is that if the mouth is kept open, there are air leaks and the positive pressure, the effect, the, the beneficial effect of the positive pressure is lost. So the helmet device for application of NIV is one of the most used device or interface for uh, uh, instituting NIV in patients with COVID-19, mostly because these devices have minimum air leaks and therefore aerosol generation and risk of 
infecting the healthcare worker is less. In addition, there is no nasal facial skin damage. However, some patients might uh, find it very noisy. And if the patient is on a ventilator, there might be some asymptomy with pressure support ventilation. And addition, uh, as you can see, it is supported by these uh, supports in the axilla, which can cause discomfort to the patient. So wherever possible, if, you're, if you have a choice of interfaces, then helmet mask is preferred only because, like I said before, the aerosol generation is less. Uh, if you have an ICU ventilator, then ideal, it would be ideal to use it, or you can use a standalone unit as well. Always use a viral filter on the expiratory limb. You initiate with a CPAP of 10 centimeters of water and pressure support of 15 centimeters of water, depending on the tidal volume, and titrate both of these to a respiratory rate of less than 20 per minute. So start with the higher FiO2 and then titrate down to maintain a saturation of 92 to 94%. The monitoring remains the same, like I said before, for uh, FHFNC. The contraindications to NIV is if you have an agitated or uncooperative patient, the patient's conscious level is reduced and is unable to protect airway. If the patient is having persistent vomiting, is hemodynamically unstable, or has copious respiratory secretions. The main adverse effects of NIV is non-acceptance and the feeling of claustrophobia. There might be some risk of aspiration as well, especially in patients who are not fully conscious. Uh, one of the uh, most uh, important side effects of NIV, especially in patients with COVID-19, is generation of excessive tidal volumes, which can lead to over-distension of alveoli and can lead to lung injury, which is also known as self-induced lung injury. Uh, if NIV is instituted in patients with uh, PF ratios of less than 150, um, it has been associated with increased mortality. So one should be careful in this group of patients. So all kinds of oxygen therapy are associated with some form of aerosol generation, which poses a risk to the a healthcare worker. However, uh, one should uh, remember that all this data that has been generated about uh, air dispersion Distance is done in an artificial model and may not necessarily apply to a real world scenario. And in addition, it has been seen now, various studies have shown that if the healthcare worker is properly attired with full protective PPE, then the chances of infection are extremely low. So to sum it up, uh, I've kind of put up an algorithm which, which can help you decide uh, how to institute oxygen therapy, what form of oxygen therapy in patients with COVID. 19. So if the patient presents to you with a low saturation that is less than 92 to 94% in room air, then it does not have any respiratory distress. Then one can start with delivering oxygen via nasal cannula uh, at four to six liters per minute. If the hypoxemia worsens, then one should shift to a non-rebreathing mask at 10 to 15 liters per minute, depending on the saturation. However, if the patient has mild to moderate respiratory distress, and has a PF ratio of less than 300, but more than 150, with a saturation of less than 90 to 94% on NRBM, then one should shift to a non-invasive strategy, which is basically of two types, like I said before. Uh, HFNC, which is the preferred modality, especially if the patient does not have hypercapnia. However, if the patient has hypercapnia or has underlying COPD, then the non-invasive strategy of choice would be a NIV. If the patient has severe respiratory distress with increased perk of breathing and also has a PF ratio of less than 50 or SF ratio of less than 196, then one should straight away go ahead and intubate the patient and put him on invasive mechanical ventilation. So to conclude, oxygen therapy is the main stage of treatment in patients suffering from COVID-19 as it reduces the work of breathing and alleviates the need for ventilator therapy. The oxygen delivery method, the choice of oxygen delivery method can be decided based on the need of the patient and the availability of the device. HFNC as a modality is very well tolerated as a ventilatory assist device and it has multiple physiological advantages and should be used as early if it is available. Risk of aerosol generation remains with all forms of um, ventilatory therapy, all forms of oxygen therapy. However, oxygen therapy is indispensable and leads to reduction of mortality. Thank you so much for your attention.